Thank you. So congratulations on making it to the end of the week and thank you for making it to my Friday early morning talk. My name is Andrea Delgado and I am a research staff at Oak Ridge National Lab. So that's uh, middle of nowhere, Tennessee. And today I will be talking about quantum machine learning for um, data analysis in high energy physics. And so this is the roadmap of, of my talk. And I want to start by giving you uh, a motivation about why some people like me believe that quantum machine learning is one of the candidates for one of the best uses of the emerging QIS technologies and also um, one of the candidates for a quantum advantage. Now, the topic of uh, quantum machine learning is uh, very broad. So uh, today I will be focusing on, on parameterized quantum circuits uh, or variational quantum circuits as machine learning models. And mainly because uh, for one, uh, they have applications on, on NISQ devices. So you can already deploy your models on, on available devices and you can just play around with uh, theory and actual hardware um, implementation. And also just to uh, complement what you already learned in uh, Peters and, and Leonardo's talk uh, this week on variational circuits. So then I will um, briefly introduce some applications. So in some of this uh, QML uh, parameterized quantum circuit based models in the analysis of classical HEP data. And uh, then I, I will briefly discuss some of the techniques that are currently available or we think work to avoid uh, variant plateaus. And finally, uh, just motivated by the discussion on, on Monday's talk, uh, so David's lecture, um, I would like to close my talk discussing whether quantum advantage is, is the right goal for quantum machine learning. And uh, so we can start. So um, quantum machine learning lies at, at the intersection of uh, quantum computing and, and machine learning. And it basically combines, uh, I guess, the best of both works. So we, from quantum computing, we have, uh, or we harness these quantum mechanical properties of matter, such as entanglement and superposition uh, for information uh, processing purposes. And then from machine learning, we leverage this large uh, mathematical framework uh, that allows us to perform inference uh, optimization and basically the use of neural networks to fit uh, functions over a large uh, hyperparameter or feature space. There's a question? No? And um, so it is precisely at this intersection where, where we're planning to build this theory of uh, quantum machine learning, uh, where we expect uh, speed up in applications such as uh, linear algebraic problems, uh, kernel methods, optimization, and more recently, deep quantum uh, machine learning. But what do we mean by, by speed up in, in this context? And what we mean is, what we, is that we expect to have a speed up in terms of execution times of these models, but we will also like to see a, a better generalization when compared to uh, classical neural networks. And if we're lucky, we can hopefully uh, get both uh, speed up and, and generalization. Now, uh, the next question that we should really be asking ourselves is uh, understanding what situations uh, we can expect this advantage to, to come up. And in this chart, with, in this chart with, which you will find practically in every QML talk, um, you can see that we can break down this broad topic of quantum machine learning into four main areas, according to either the type of data that we're analyzing or the type of algorithm that we're dealing with. And so we can start with the top right corner right here, um, classical algorithms and classical data. And this is where the classical machine learning, um, I guess, field lies in. So we really just con con uh, consider it for, for completeness. Then it comes the application of classical data on, on quantum data, where there has been a lot of development on applying machine learning to quantum systems for, uh, for optimal control, um, learning quantum dynamics of quantum systems and optimizing qubit readout, for example. 
Then if we move to the left hemisphere of, uh, of this chart, we, we go into the, the application of quantum algorithms. And if we think about uh, apply them into uh, classical data, this is where most uh, HP applications to date um, live. And finally, uh, a very interesting, rather unexplored field is the, the application of quantum algorithms to quantum data, where some people have initiated or started to explore the use of quantum algorithms for chemical simulation, uh, quantum matter simulation, uh, quantum control, uh, networks, and, and metrology. Now, uh, particularly for the type of algorithms that we're considering or on the left side of, of this uh, chart, uh, it's important to understand when uh, quantum computing can help speed up or improve some machine learning tasks. And just like Hank mentioned on, on his talk uh, the other day, we really need to understand um, the problem that, that we're trying to target and not only the kind of algorithm that, that we're using, but also the type of data. And I would like to point you uh, to a very interesting manuscript, the, the power of data in, in quantum machine learning, where they draw uh, three main conclusions associated with the type of data that we should be analyzing in the context of quantum machine learning. And so the first question or the first conclusion that they reach is that they, it is very unlikely that quantum machine learning will be classical machine learning um, on classical data. And we expect this to be especially true for the case of large data sets and without the ability uh, to access this data in parallel or using a, a quantum RAM. The second conclusion that they draw is that uh, just because data uh, might come from a hard to classically simulate a quantum circuit, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be hard for a classical machine learning model to learn. So some people have argued that if you, um, if you take, for example, a VQE and extract data from, from that quantum system, that doesn't mean necessarily that it will be hard for a classical machine learning model to, to learn that information. And the last conclusion that they draw is that uh, data sets and ultimately uh, quantum in nature that are easy for quantum models uh, to learn and hard for classical models uh, to learn, they do exist. So we haven't found it yet, but they, they must exist. And this is regardless of, of the architecture or the, or the training algorithms that, that you can think of. And um, if you want to know more about like, uh, I guess the rigorous or like the mathematical background and the proofs about uh, these statements, you can read um, this manuscript uh, or reference uh, right here. So um, when we say today quantum, model, quantum models, uh, what are we actually referring to? And just like you've been hearing all week, uh, we are in the NISQ era of uh, quantum computing. And I want to go briefly about what this means for quantum machine learning. And as we will see today, uh, most of the practical applications that are being uh, studied on these days are developed for deployment on NISQ devices, which we expect to have a few qubits. Uh, we expect them to be noisy and to have a low gate fidelity. There's also been a lot of development on developing on on developing quantum machine learning specific tools such as uh, like Penny Lane or, or Google TensorFlow um, that allows us not only to bridge uh, just quantum and classical machine learning, but also to leverage the tools that we're already familiar with like uh, Keras and, and TensorFlow and use them in, in like a hybrid setting. Um, another buzzword these days is uh, co-design. And what this implies for uh, quantum machine learning is that really we, sh we should be thinking about designing ANSATs or, or circuit designs that are uh, best suited for NISQ devices and in terms of uh, like the size of the connectivity of, of these devices. And some people are even thinking about designing ANSATs or uh, circuit designs at the pulse level. And this is inspired by the layer-wise structure that we have in these QML models 
So instead of uh, transpiling your circuit into like the native gates of the architecture that you want to run into, you can maybe design like a block uh, for, for your particular layer. And uh, as we will see in today's talk, uh, most of the applications are based on, on the hybrid uh, frameworks that you learn about this week from uh, Peter and, and Leonardo's talk. And uh, for the reminder of this talk, we will be discussing how to think about uh, parameterized quantum circuits as, as machine learning models. And most of the discussion today is based on this manuscript by uh, Benedetti et al. Uh, and this is like the archive number if you're interested in, in reading more, most about it. And in this context, we think about uh, variational circuits as machine learning models by drawing on, on the similarities with a, a classical neural network where you have some input data or some classical data that you want to analyze. Then you have a particular task uh, that is your target. You call it classification, uh, clustering, generative modeling. But here we replace the neural network with a, a parameterized quantum circuit. And basically, in both cases, this uh, learning scheme describes the process of updating the model parameters. So in, in, in this quantum context, you can think about the, the rotational parameters of, of your quantum circuit. And then you optimize it uh, towards a specific goal. So the main components of, of a, a parameter, parameterized quantum circuit are uh, the following, and we will go into the details of uh, each one of these, uh, I guess, ingredients for your recipe in the next couple of slides. And also I should, uh, a disclaimer, I should say that this is like a, a very general scheme. So you will need to adapt it to, to your particular application. And the first uh, ingredient in our recipe is, uh, is the pre-processing and, and the encoding of, of your classical data. And I think this is the main difference uh, with the applications that were discussed uh, on, on Monday and Wednesday where you have a VQE or a QAOA, for example, where you have like a defined Hamiltonian system that, that you want to prepare or, or like your target. Here we have a uh, classical data that we want to really cast into the quantum world. So suppose we start uh, with a feature vector X uh, that can be some n-dimensional vector, or we can say it's the picture of a cat if we're trying to classify pictures of cats. And uh, that it, in that input is really uh, the prior to our machine learning model. And by that, uh, by that, I mean, if you're not familiar with the machine learning context is that you can have access to all the pictures of cats. So you basically have a subset of pictures of cats and then you expect your model to learn from like that limited, uh, I guess, region of, of the phase space of, of all the possible pictures of cats. And uh, oftentimes you will see that because of the limited uh, resources that we have right now in terms of like qubits, um, most of these models will use a, a pre-processing or, or like a feature reduction uh, technique such as PCA to reduce the number of features and, and encode that in, into a quantum state. So then uh, we can use several techniques to, to achieve that goal. And there's been a lot of development on that area. And if you want to look at a specific uh, quantum embedding technique, such as the basis amplitude embedding, you can check out uh, these references right here. So the next ingredient in, in our recipe is the actual variational or optimizable part of the circuit. And so, uh, I guess just a parenthesis here, I think it's important or, or interesting to, to figure out where the, the term ansatz comes from, because really just thinking about the, the application in like VQEs or, or like the, I guess the, the early uh, literature on, on parameterized quantum circuits, this, uh, this method was based on, on the variational method in, in quantum mechanics, where you will try to have a guess or like a trial function for a system that you're trying to find the ground state to. And that's where, where the term ansatz comes from. 
So I'll be interchangeably saying ansatz or circuit design or in the penny lane context, a, a template. And also as opposed to the applications that you learn about uh, early in the week, there's really no systematic way um, about finding your, your choice of circuits. So most of the literature, you will find that it's just trial and error. We have some educated guesses about why we want to choose a, a particular design or ansatz, but there's really not a, like a systematic way of doing so. And then the final ingredient of our quantum machine learning model is uh, the measuring or, or the post-processing step where the information about uh, your quantum state is, uh, I guess, transfer back into the classical world. And, and you can do that by evaluating some sort of like expectation value of, of an observable. And then you can use that to inform or to construct a, a function uh, for your particular task. So you can take that set of measurements to do uh, uh, a decision function, a probability distribution, a boundary, depending on, on your particular application. And before I move on into the next section, are there any questions? Sure. Um, so Hank's question uh, here in the audience was that uh, just, I guess, elaborate more on what I mean. If you have uh, classical data that it's coming out of a quantum circuit or, or a quantum experiment, why should we expect that a machine learning model might be as good as a quantum machine learning model in, in learning the information from that classical data? And the answer I think has, I would, I think I will answer with two questions. <laughs> and the first one is, if you have uh, quantum information, why would you want to uh, take it to the classical world and then analyze it in a classical setting? Because for me, the, the best way to do it will be to just couple the two systems and analyze it as quantum. But then let's say there's no reasonable way of doing it and you convert your quantum information into classical information and then use both models. And there's been a lot of studies on, on that area where I'm not saying that the classical model is not gonna be able, is gonna perform better, but at, at this stage with the, the size of the systems that we have, what we've seen is that the classical and quantum models are like on par. So there's really no advantage. And the statement from the beginning was that if you are analyzing quantum data, then your quantum model should be better. But so far we have found no proof that that is the case. And to your question, then you add up like the overhead of like converting it back to a quantum state. So I think that will like pretty much override any quantum advantage. Um, question uh, on the chat. Okay, uh, question number one. What was the purpose of the Ancilla qubits on the circuit? So like I said at the beginning, this is like a very uh, general uh, layer for, for a parametrized quantum circuit. And you can think about using extra ancillary qubits that are not going into your, your embedding, um, I guess, unitary. If you have to perform, for example, like a swap test or any other um, post embedding uh, operation that will require ancillary qubits. But that's really not the case. Like you don't need ancillary qubits for, 
every application. Then the second question was, can detectors in HEP experiments actually preserve the quantum state without decohering? And well, the answer is no, because all the data that we get from glider experiments, neutrino experiments is uh, converted back to classical. But I think at this point, uh, an interesting question will be to really rethink our HEP detectors and think about if we're looking, for example, for a dark matter, can we have like an, an array of sensors instead of, and don't hate me for this, instead of like the next big high energy physics collider, and then just take the data that we have from those sensors and analyze it uh, with a quantum machine learning model. But that will be like, uh, I guess a topic for, for like a coffee chat or something. Uh, no more questions on the chat. Questions, the audience. So the question is, uh, what do I mean by a deep uh, quantum model? And so basically in the context of quantum machine learning, a deep uh, quantum model will be something that has uh, a lot of layers, or you can think about uh, convolutional neural networks where you not only have like a, like a block or like a single pattern of uh, your circuit structure, but you repeat that several ways. So this is a, an interesting question. And for the people in Zoom, the question is uh, to elaborate more on the parallel between neural networks and parameterized quantum circuits. And you're right in the sense that uh, a parameterized quantum circuit doesn't explicitly have like that nonlinearity that you see in neural networks. And that's, oh, that's basically, because you have to maintain the unitarity of your um, of your circuit, but uh, on the other hand, on the next couple of slides, you can think about the parameterized quantum circuits as QML models as performing, um, I guess, a linear classification in a in a highly dimensional feature space, as opposed to uh, neural networks where you apply a nonlinear classification in um, in your feature space. So I don't know if that answers your questions. So I guess the short answer is no. You can't expect that to have that inherently uh, nonlinearity from your neural networks, but it's just another way to see it. Um, okay, so in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to provide some examples of how these uh, BQCs or PQCs can be used in a, in a um, circuit learning uh, setting for some data-driven tasks and specifically for HEP tasks. And I will focus because there has been a lot of development on like new models, but I will focus on, on two, uh, a quantum support vector machine and uh, a generative model. And basically I chose these two because I think personally that those are the two models that are on the way to show uh, a quantum advantage. And so the first application is uh, based on, on kernel methods for supervised learning. And I'm going to describe uh, these applications in a, in a very high level fashion, because I know it's Friday and you're probably tired and want to go home. But if you want to learn more, like in a more rigorous way, there's, uh, there's some really interesting discussion on these two references at the top of the slide. 
And the main uh, premise, I guess, on exploring these uh, kernel methods for classification tasks, um, and particularly those assisted by quantum computers, is the fact that these, I guess, these two paradigms, uh, quantum machine learning and, and kernel-based methods, are very similar. And just let me elaborate um, on that. So if you're not familiar with kernel methods from uh, the classical machine learning uh, context, um, these methods are based on a, a so-called kernel trick. So let's say uh, we have a data set that has two features and here you have uh, stars and, and then you have hearts. And this is uh, what your data points look like if you plot them in your two dimensional feature space. Now you will agree that with me that it will be really hard to find um, a boundary line in, in this data set. And if you do, you will also agree with me that it will be very hard to generalize if you try uh, your boundary line on a, on a slightly different data set, then your model will probably fail. But it turns out if you apply uh, the so-called kernel trick, um, you can apply a feature map uh, phi here that takes your input data into a higher dimensional space. So in this case, we went from 2D uh, to 3D, where you can actually define a clear boundary or separation for your data. And this will also probably have a better uh, generalization properties. Um, but if you think about it, this kernel trick is basically the same I guess uh, the same thing that we are doing when we want to encode classical into quantum data, because you're encoding your classical data into this exponentially large uh, Hilbert space. And so that's basically why people are thinking about exploring quantum support vector machines for in the QML context. Now, these feature maps are the basics for the so-called support uh, vector machines. And here, um, you can take advantage of the fact that uh, if you have, or if you take the inner product of, of your feature map, you basically um, are getting a, a measure of how similar two data points are. So if you take uh, that into consideration, you can train a, a support vector machine by using a loss function that looks like this, plus uh, whatever extra terms that you need for your model. But this is based on, on your kernel, where your kernel is basically the, the inner product of, of your two um, feature maps, and Y are your labels, and then AI I, uh, or alpha I are your, your data points. And by minimizing this function, you can find the, uh, the alpha I or like the, the vectors that are not zero and those will be your support vectors. And then from here on, the name of the game is to maximize the, the distance between these two support vectors to define a, a boundary line for like a linear classification. And then you could construct, uh, I guess, some sort of like decision function where if you take new data S that is outside of your uh, training data set, then you should be able to assign a label for your uh, classification problem. So how can we uh, build or how can we translate this model into the quantum context? And so we build on this uh, parallel between feature maps and information encoding into a quantum state. But then the next thing, uh, so we encode our information into a Hilbert space or our feature space. But then the next thing we have to think about is how to access this information. And in the classical setting, uh, you can access the information by, by kernel manipulation. So you construct your matrix and then define your boundary line in that way. In the quantum setting, you are really thinking about accessing your Hilbert space by just uh, making measurements. And then, um, in this quantum uh, setting, the optimization scheme for, for building your, your decision or your boundary is the same as uh, in the classical setting. And really the only difference is how you build your, your kernel. 
because in the quantum setting, you can take uh, your feature map as a, as a unitary and then prepare a state, for example, in, in the all zero state and perform measurements by taking the, the inverse of your unitary. And that's how you construct your, like your kernel. Now, these are uh, some examples of, of some work that has been done in the context of high energy physics on exploring these kernel-based quantum models. And we will see that some of the early applications were, uh, I guess, uh, tested on, on a small number of quantum registers. So for example, here, they, um, they benchmark their model on four, six, and, and eight qubits. But as you can see, there is no, uh, or we can see no quantum advantage so far, like the QSVM performs as well as the, as the classical one. And then it comes the question of how these models are scale. So you can look at this other reference where they run a simulation of uh, 15 qubits, uh, up to 20 qubits, and then run on hardware for 15 qubits. And again, so far, uh, the performance is very similar to, to the classical. Um, SVM. And also, uh, I should mention that these techniques or uh, these studies employ uh, dimensionality reduction techniques. So there, it's really hard to say whether there's a, an advantage or not. Um, so another um, applications uh, in this one is a, a more recent one where they actually uh, looked at different uh, encodings. So, and by encoding, I mean uh, like the feature map. So they look at, at, to a couple of different encodings and then compare that to a classical SVM. And I think it's interesting to see that even when you try different feature maps, the result is very similar for, for all of them. It, and it's even closer to, to a classical setting. And the final one is a study where they use a quantum SVM for a supernova classification and they run on the Google Sycamore uh, processor on 17 qubits. And again, you can see that the accuracy that they get is the same as, as the previous uh, models that were trained on, on the IBM hardware. And also you can see here how uh, running on, on the actual device brings down this accuracy by by a lot. Now, um, a short summary on, on kernel methods. So we talked about how we can use these feature maps for an enhanced classification uh, power on this higher dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And really our hope as uh, practitioners is that the QML version of these kernel methods um, will have eventually an advantage when we find uh, a kernel that is hard to estimate classically. There's been some theories of uh, kernels that are hard to estimate classically, but uh, I, I don't think I've seen like a, like a definite statement. Um, now there's a, a caveat to, to this statement I just made on, on quantum advantage. And that is, uh, and it has to do with the size uh, of your data set and how the number of evaluations that you need to perform to train your model scale, scales with the size of your data set. And for that discussion, I would like to point you to this Penny Lane tutorial uh, where they actually study this effect. But basically, I will tell you the, the conclusions that they found. And they discovered that if you have a classification task and you want to use a quantum machine learning model that can be solved or um, where you can use a variational circuit or, or a quantum kernel based method, the performance of, of your model, if you use a variational circuit, um, if the parameters that you need to train your model scales with, uh, with the size of data set, you will need exponentially a large number of evaluations. So that will give you a worse performance than if you train a, a quantum kernel but on the other hand, if you have a model where your, your parameters uh, scale almost linear with uh, the size of your data set, then you will really be better off by using uh, a variational circuit. And I think that's something uh, really 
uh, to consider when using these models. And uh, just to be clear, the number of evaluation, that means the number of circuits that you have to run to train your model. Um, another important model are a quantum circuit born machines in QCBMs for short. And QCBMs are used in the context of uh, unsupervised generative modeling. And they were inspired by the probabilistic nature of uh, quantum mechanics. So that means that they rely on a, a very basic principle, which is the ability to represent the, the probability distribution of a quantum data set as a quantum state. And it, if you can do so, then you can obtain samples by evaluating your circuit um, or uh, just making a measurement. And so that's basically the, the Born rule and that's how, that's how they got their name. That's why they're called quantum circuit Born machines. So for example, uh, in the story example, you can take a discretized uh, Gaussian probability distribution over two to the n qubits uh, basis states or, or bins. So in this example, if we have uh, four qubits, then you get two to the four uh, 16 basis states or bins. And so basically your bins become your zero, 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 one, and, and all of your possible states when you perform a measurement. Now to train uh, a QCVM, we basically again train another parameterized quantum circuit. And uh, as a reminder, this uh, structure is different to the application that we just saw before for uh, an SVM. And here our parameterized quantum circuit will basically contain uh, an n number of layers of, of this block of rotation gates that are applied to a single qubit and also uh, a block of entangling gates. And uh, so again, the number of layers is associated with how expressive your circuit is. So how, how do we train uh, a QCVM? And so the training workflow is uh, very simple and it's summarized on, on this cartoon here. So basically you prepare a quantum circuit by uh, choosing uh, a design or, or ansatz that you think is well suited for your problem. And if it doesn't work, you try another one, which is what we do every day. And um, so the choices for ansatz are usually informed by the kind of hardware that you're gonna use. So for example, if you run on the IBM devices, you don't have like the full connectivity. So you really need to think about uh, minimizing the or applying the C nuts on pairs of qubits that are actually connected on hardware. Um, there are some designs that are uh, believed to be robust uh, against variant plateaus, such as the uh, like the brick layer ansatz that was developed by the Los Alamos team. But I think that's very application dependent, so you should really um, think about your application. Now, um, again, this is uh, the basic training workflow where you initialize your circuit in either like an all zero state. You can also initialize it in like a Bell state or, or a GAC state if your um, quantum register number allows for it. And then you can perform some measurements on your circuit and then evaluate a loss function on your target and, and your sample distribution. We usually train it using gradient-based uh, optimization, such as uh, like Adam and, and other gradient-based uh, methods. And then we can update the, the parameters based on the information from, from this optimization scheme. And so one, uh, one round of, of this uh, training is, is what we call uh, a, a training step.
if I understood the question, you're asking if the measurement is made over all the registers on your system? Um, so if I understand correctly, your question is whether when we evaluate uh, the loss function, if you evaluate like on a bin by bin basis on your distribution, or if you, is, is that the question? Uh, yes. So basically uh, we don't, the thing is there are several ways to do it. Um, for the particular case that I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, we look at the differences in the probability distribution. So you sample from your circuit for an n number of shots and then look at, uh, at the probability distribution. It's basically like what you said. But I, I know there are smarter ways to do it. This, just this picture corresponds to the application I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, okay, um, and that brings me, I guess, to the next point I wanted to make that uh, for training this kind of models, there's a lot of parameters involved. So there are several ways to encode information into your target distribution. Uh, there's different ways to evaluate uh, your loss. There are several um, optimization schemes that you can use, uh, hyperparameters associated with these uh, schemes and the number of steps that you take into the training and also the number of shots to build your probability distribution. But just to give you an idea, like a ballpark estimate of, of the resources and the hyperparameters that we're dealing with, we can go back to the learning of the optimal parameters to prepare a uh, discretized Gaussian distribution over um, four qubits. And then on the left, you have uh, the light pink is uh, the target distribution. And then I guess the purple one is what the distribution looks like when you evaluate it on like random parameters. And so if we use a QCVM on four qubits and use the cosine distance metric, and we prepare uh, a VQC on this uh, penny lane layout called basic entangling layers that it's basically, I, I think very similar to the brick layer ansatz. Use these hyperparameter strain for a number of steps and use almost uh, 9,000 shots. Then you can, after the end of the training, reproduce this uh, Gaussian probability distribution with, uh, with a high fidelity, which I think is it's pretty nice. But now I guess your next question is, that is, oh, oh, there's a question. Yeah, uh, so the question for the Zoom people, the question on the room is about, uh, I guess, basically the, the shot noise. How can we estimate the number of measurements that we need to take in the perfect case uh, scenario to accurately uh, 
I guess, reproduce these distributions. And that's something I'm gonna come back on the next slide. So just bear with me. Um, so, okay, can we do something that has an, an even more practical applications between, because really just uh, reproducing Gaussian distribution, it's not something really exciting in, in the classical machine learning setting. But it turns out that we can actually use QCVMs to learn uh, joint distributions and take advantage of the entanglementness of, of our quantum system. And so now let me tell you about uh, this study where we use the, uh, some of the jet kinematic variables in an atypical LHC event, such as the, the transverse momentum and, and the jet mass to train um, an eight qubit and then a 12 qubit QCVM. And so what do we find out? Well, after trial and, and error of selecting a, a choice of, of ansatz, we presented results for these two ansatz. So the first one is sort of like the brick layer ansatz where you have um, in a layer of entangling gates over every two, every pair of, of qubits in, in your register. And then we have sort of like this, what we call this disconnected tree ansatz because for, um, if we think about one quantum register uh, preparing one of the marginal distributions in your joint distribution uh, setting, each of the two or eventually three registers are not connected uh, between them. So the qubits in the register are connected among them, but not on, not on the second and, and third register. So that's why we call it uh, like a disconnected tree. Um, and what you see on the plot on the left is how, how good we can reproduce these distributions by training our, our QCVMs. And then uh, on the bottom, we plot the ratio. So as you can see, this is uh, very close to one. We've also studied the, the correlation functions between these two variables. So the gray distribution is the actual uh, Monte Carlo expectation or, or the ground truth for, for these distributions. And this is the correlations that these two variables have uh, between them. So for ANSATS one, which is this blue one right here, we see that our model was actually able to reproduce uh, this correlation. So it's, it's very close to the ground state. Now for this disconnected tree, as we would expect, this uh, QCVM is able to, to some degree, reproduce the marginal distributions, but it's not able to reproduce the correlation. So there's really zero correlations between these two variables as we see in the, on the training data set. And then uh, I guess just coming back to the, the question on, on how the number of shots affect the uh, our training, uh, we did this plot for our, our 12 qubit ansatz so that we use that ansatz to, or that QCVM to prepare a 3D, uh, three variable joint distribution. And I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the straight line corresponds to whenever we train using the uh, penny lane baseline of 9,000 shots. And then when we increase that to uh, 20K shots, which are the, the triangles here, we can see that we can actually bring down the, the value of our loss function, the, the Jensen channel loss to an even uh, lower value. And if you think about it, just pointing to your argument, I think it makes sense because for an eight Q with uh, QCVM, you're sampling over two to the eight, I think that's 256 mm -hmm. basis states. But whenever we go up to 12 qubits, you're actually sampling over uh, 4,096 states. So um, 9K was, was just not enough. We also tried a, a larger number of shots, but we see really no uh, difference. So, so that's what we kept at, at 20,000. So, um, we also wanted to understand how uh, hardware noise affects the training uh, because what I've showed you so far, like all of these results, we, we run on, on the penny lane uh, simulator. So that means no, no noise. 
but we wanted to see how, how these experiments will run on hardware. And we did a, a small, not so small experiment, and it's kind of like a convoluted uh, scheme, so please bear with me. And so if we think about our eight qubit uh, QCBM training where we use two ansatz with uh, 39 layers of rotational and entangling gates. So that's, uh, it was about like 400 parameters that need to be trained. We obtain, we train on simulation and obtain an optimal set of parameters. And then we went and executed that circuit on hardware on the optimal parameters. And so the plot that you see here is, uh, so blue is the, the IBM device. We use uh, IBM uh, Guadalupe. And then uh, the, the black line is, is the simulator. So we took sort of like a layer-wise learning on hardware training, where we start from the first layer and then slowly uh, perform a sweep over the parameters over that single layer, over um, a range of minus pi. Uh, over four to pi to the fourth. And then we took the best value over that parameter sweep and uh, then moved on into the next layer. So as you can see here, uh, for the first uh, number of executions, really when we execute our circuits on, on hardware, this uh, lost landscape, because that's the, the vertical axis on this plot is uh, very flat. But then as we move to even more layers, when we're actually trying to optimize these uh, rotational parameters on hardware, we start seeing some effects of like doing the parameter sweep and, and then the landscape is getting, uh, I guess, less flat. And so each one of these uh, plots right here, so this one is for step one, this one's for step 19, uh, step 35, is uh, each one of these uh, boxes on this plot. So there are several things that we can, uh, I guess, conclude when, when we look at this plot. And the first one of them is that uh, the, opti the optimal parameters that we obtain by running on simulation are very far from what they should be in, in the experiment with, uh, that that's expected. And also as we train uh, on hardware, then we start seeing again, this effect. And also as, uh, as we start changing these parameters and adapt them to what the hardware wants to see, then the simulations just as expected uh, starts getting worse and worse. But also uh, it's, we were hoping to at least come down to what we got uh, on simulation, but, but just that never happened, like even, if we're able to decrease the, the loss value uh, by some degree, it's never close to what we get um, on simulation. And so if you're thinking uh, what happens when we execute our QCVM or like generate a, a probability distribution from, from after running that experiment, this is what, what it looks like. And as you can see, they, they are not so great. And this moving picture right here, um, was a, I guess, a live uh, cartoon about how these parameters really just go from being like a really sharp distribution to like a, what I think it is or wants to be like a, like a more entangled state. Um, okay, so a summary on on supervised uh, generative models. And just to conclude this section, I personally believe that, that these generative models are, are going to be one of the most promising avenues for reaching a, a quantum advantage. Uh, some caveats again to this statement is that uh, so far we have found that the performance is comparable to, to classical methods. And that most of the exercises or experiments that we've uh, done in the past, they are trained on simulation. So we really need to understand or to develop schemes to actually like either train on hardware or, uh, 
or come up with better ideas to really like harness the uh, the advantages of, of running on, on quantum hardware. And there's still uh, a lot of open questions on, on this area. Uh, for example, um, I think the most important one is uh, scalability. So can we actually train a model that cannot be simulated classically? And I think uh, currently HPC systems can probably simulate systems with 65 qubits or so. So we are like way beyond what can be simulated classically. And we need to come up with a, a systematic way of, of designing ANSATs because it, it's really time consuming to just do like trial and error. Uh, develop also more robust training schemes and also super important, I didn't cover today because I know yesterday you had a full day of uh, quantum error correction, but it's also really hard to scale the current uh, quantum error correction uh, schemes uh, to the size of, of these models and, and beyond that. And also, uh, I just talked about uh, my, my work, but you should really check out uh, the work of some of my colleagues uh, and even ask them, like one of them is sitting right here with you, um, where they run a similar um, QCBM training for the simulation of Monte Carlo events. And also this uh, generative adversarial network for also Monte Carlo event uh, generation. And you can see uh, Dorota is uh, one of the authors as well. So you should really check it out. Any questions before I move to the next section? So the question is uh, if the number of shots is associated with the number of qubits and the answer is yes, like you would expect it. Because uh, again, as I said, uh, when moving to a larger number of qubits, then you have a larger, num a larger number of basis states. So uh, I like to think about it like that game where you just have like, like bins and then you're putting like dots inside of the bin. So if you have a small number of dots, then you can really populate your, your distribution. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So the question uh, is, if I know how to scale it, like you mean if there is like a, I guess like a rule on the number of shots that you need to take? Uh, as far as I know, there isn't, but then there's also um, issues related to the number of shots that you can actually uh, execute in hardware. So IBM has a, a cutoff on the number of shots that you can take. And I think it's like 10,000, if I'm not wrong, for, for other devices, I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say it's one of other many hyperparameters that we need to optimize. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, the next section is uh, on barren plateaus and, and how to avoid them. Now, uh, disclaimer, this is just a review of the literature and I know that people are going to have opinions or comments on whether they work or not. Like, and these are not my views, so just take it with a grain of salt. And uh, as a reminder from, from Wednesday's, Wednesday's lecture, a barren plateau uh, usually occurs in, in BQCs whenever uh, the circuit is uh, too random. So it basically means that you're preparing a state uh, with nearly uh, maximum entropy. And the wave function of your system is essentially spread 
all over the exponentially large uh, Hilbert space. So that means that you need to take a larger number of measurements to observe um, or to estimate the observable that you're interested in. And this uh, extrapolates to the calculation of your gradients because then you you get stuck into like a like a flat landscape. And if you're interested about uh, exploring this effect yourself, I will also like to point you to another jet great uh, penny lane tutorial on barren plateaus where they walk you through how to construct a circuit and then study the variance of, of a, a loss function or, or an expectation value and how is this scales with the number of qubits. So, so you see this trend right here. And in the next couple of slides, I will try to uh, just briefly describe some of the techniques that have been developed over the last uh, couple of years. And so the first one is, uh, the discussion about using local versus uh, global functions. And this was discussed on, on Wednesday's lecture, where, uh, as you probably know already, most of the applications to date in, in QML use uh, global uh, cost functions. And we just saw from the previous slide, uh, the effect of the vanishing gradient has, uh, or how it scales with the number of qubits. So the main idea of using uh, a local uh, cost function instead of a global cost function is that you're essentially optimizing your cost function over like a, like a shallower circuit. And again, if you want to read uh, uh, the, the reference where this uh, discussion is, is discussed in detail, this is the reference, but also there's another penny lane tutorial that walks you through uh, an example where they try to learn the, I guess, I think it's the identity state. And they clearly um, show uh, the difference between using a global cost function where you have like this flat valley where it's hard to escape. So if you start your training from one of these points, it's, it's just really hard to, to get out of there. Whereas if you use a local cost function, then you see like more, uh, a more sharply peaked landscape. Another idea that I think is very popular among uh, QML practitioners is the idea of uh, layer wise training. So basically, just like its name suggests, uh, you do your training uh, layer wise and then you gradually increment uh, the, the size of your circuit during uh, optimization. And you only update or optimize subsets of parameters. And this has been shown to, to work for uh, circuits with a large number of, of layers. And as you can see on this plot, that is uh, that you can find on the original reference, uh, LL is layer wise and CDL is like the full training. It usually uh, performs better in terms of the expected number of repetitions and, and the success uh, probability of, of your training for different in initializations. Um, another method is uh, that is, I guess it's less widely known is the method of uh, identity, block identity initialization, where you construct a circuit or you design your ansatz so that you have blocks that effectively uh, become the identity. So the resulting state that you are training is a product state. So that means no entanglement essentially. And for that reason, uh, there is no variant plateaus. And if you're not sure why this statement is true, it's because if, if your circuit is too random, it means that you are near uh, the maximal entanglement entropy. And this is the, the reference of the, the original study. And you can see how they take uh, how, how the variance scales for just starting with a, a random circuit and how for a large number of qubits, you sort of like stop this uh, steeply falling curve and then you get something better as, or that it scales better with, with the number of qubits. So the question is, if you can train uh, a product state. Well, 
Yes, that's correct. Yes, and that was uh, my disclaimer at, at the beginning of uh, of the of this section. Like all of these, I guess, uh, ways to overcome barren plateaus are very specific for very specific problems and under certain conditions. I agree. <laughs> But um, I don't know what, what got me into reading this reference was, was one of the authors like he's. But I, I personally haven't tried this myself. Uh, so the last one is uh, a recent PRX paper that came out uh, on this year by Los Alamos team, where they claim that if you restrict the range that your uh, qubit uh, your parameterized gates can take, then you can actually or effectively avoid uh, barren plateaus. So that's uh, that's the statement. That's it. But I really like uh, this picture that they have uh, on their paper. Where uh, okay, where they also uh, discuss generalization. So if you have um, an ansatz that it's highly overparameterized, then it has uh, better generalization power because you can pretty much access a problem, what they call problem A and B. But then if your um, ansatz is uh, less parameterized, then you probably can only target the problem that you're training your circuit on. But then there's a trade-off on how the landscape looks like in, in generalization. And, and this is the, the reference here. Now, uh, before I conclude my talk, uh, I would like to spend a, a couple of minutes uh, talking about uh, one of the manuscripts that was uh, referred to or, or discussed on Mondays during uh, David's talk. And that is the, the paper by Maria Scholl and, and team on whether the quantum advantage uh, is the right goal for quantum machine learning. And if you go through the paper, uh, the short answer, I guess, is that that's a no, and at least not in the near future. Uh, but why, why they claim that this is the case? And first of all, uh, they claim that machine learning, classical that is, is already uh, a hard problem. And there's still a lot of work being done on, on finding a basis for generalization. And this is related to the fact that neural networks are uh, essentially, just like we were discussing, uh, sequences of linear and nonlinear transformations, which makes them hard to uh, simulate and, and really understand what's going on like under the hood. And once we add uh, like quantumness into the mix, it becomes uh, even worse because uh, so far for everything we know uh, in the QML community, in, in most cases uh, comes from just trying things like trial and error with no like rigorous mathematical uh, uh, basis for that. And just like I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, we really cannot say much about the behavior of quantum machine learning models uh, beyond what, what can be simulated classically. So the bottom line is that probably quantum advantage uh, shouldn't be the primary goal for, or like the primary focus in, in quantum machine learning. Uh, some uh, pointers that they make is that we should probably be identifying practical applications, uh, but that's a question that it's uh, still wide open. And we probably won't get an answer until we get past uh, running small scale experiments, which is what has been done in the community. Uh, over the last couple of years. Now, they also make a statement about uh, whether we should be focusing on, on coupling quantum machine learning to, to quantum data or quantum devices. And I think there was a weak argument about uh, probably not, but it's my personal point of view that we should be really thinking about coupling these models with, for example, uh, a quantum sensors. So we are beginning to understand how entanglement works and how they affect the training of our uh, variational circuits, for example. And we can probably harness that to build larger uh, 
uh, networks of sensors. So now we are, um, I guess, very well versed in the methods of uh, anomaly detection. So if you have, again, a, a network of quantum sensors and you're trying to find dark matter, you can probably harness those properties to, to do a better or like an enhanced anomaly detection. And finally, uh, since there's a lot of work to be done in, in, in the area of like hardware development, really, I guess the people that are working on the hardware benefit from, from using QML for system control. Um, as a summary, uh, are there any questions? So as a summary of uh, my today's talk, I, I talked about parameterized quantum circuits as, as machine learning models in what I think will be one of the prime candidates for near-term applications and also uh, a quantum advantage. But I, will still think, I still think that there's a, a lot of work to be done in understanding how these quantum machine learning models compare among themselves. Like uh, there's really, um, there hasn't been a lot of effort in like benchmarking quantum guns and QCBMs. Like are, are we treating them on the same footing? And it's even harder to compare them to classical machine learning models. So we really need to understand this to, to improve, I guess, uh, our models for the future. Um, there are several things that I didn't cover today because I was only given uh, one uh, session, but I will really encourage you to read about it. And one of them is continuous variable quantum machine learning. It's a field that it's uh, unexplored basically. And that has to do with the fact that the the kind of gates like non gaussian gates that you need to come up with in order to be implemented on hardware they're not available so it's really hard to find a model or an application that can have a, a quantum advantage so something that cannot be simulated classically and also on wednesday i know there was a talk about tensor networks but there's also a, a whole field uh, that are thinking about using tensor networks as, as machine learning models so that's another interesting topic. And I hope I convince you that uh, quantum machine learning, it's, it's an exciting field. There's a lot of work to do, so a lot of job security. And with that, uh, I would like to finish my talk. And that's my email if you want to contact me. Very good, thank you. Uh, there are other questions? We already had plenty during the talk. No? Yes. Hi, yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so then I have a very quick question. So in the last slide when you were mentioning about whether the uh, adv quantum advantage is the right goal, uh, I mean, I agree with that somehow small scale uh, numerical experiments are not particularly useful to answer that question, but what's wrong with the theoretical proofs? With the, the question is whether, what's wrong with this train of thought? Like just strain things out? Yeah, so why are theoretical proofs, uh, I mean, which are possibly limited or toy problems, what's, what's wrong with them? No, I, uh, in this slide, I'm, I'm like sort of like summarizing the points on, on this opinion paper, but I personally think that there's value in exploring these uh, small scale like experiments. But in my opinion, people have just tried to develop um, algorithms that can run on like four or six qubit and they say, okay, we get similar performance and, and that's great, but we really should be thinking about like scaling them. And to extrapolate to, to the area where, where we cannot simulate it. And also, uh, I guess, just like we saw in, in some of the applications, we are like really starting to understand like the role of like entanglement uh, has on like the training on this model. So I, I personally believe that there's a lot of advantage in, 
in just trying things out. Can I have another question? So maybe a more practical question then. Uh, so you showed some. Uh, so you showed the results about the quantum circuit board machines for uh, for for high energy data, and you you discussed about the. So how do you choose the answer? The answers, right? Uh, I mean, is there any ideas on how to do that? Because I mean, what what I'm what I'm thinking about so in condensed matter or in quantum chemistry, so one has some let's say intuition like this coupled clusters or. Uh, uh, this Hamiltonian uh, ancestry that uh, Peter was describing. Is there something similar or can we expect something similar for high energy data? My goal or my personal hope will be that yes, I'm trying to work on like an adaptive QCVM because uh, like the ansatz that we're using, it works, but I think that it's uh, highly over parameterized. So there should be a smarter way to just uh, remove the extra gates that, that we don't need. And that will reduce our um, training by, by a lot. So, so I think that's an active area of research. So hopefully, yes. So how do we measure quantum advantage? Should we be interested in processing costs or quality? of learning model output. So I think there's several ways to quantify that. Uh, I guess on the more like theoretical basis, uh, there's a, um, from like the information theory perspective, there's like uh, measures on, on the complexity in, I guess in the more practical way, we always talk about like run times in, in the amount of data that we need to train the model. Okay, are there other questions? No, let's thank Andrea. Ah, there's one. Ah, no. Let's thank Andrea again. Thank you very much. <laughs>